wanted to talk to somebody who straddles both worlds, the worlds of traditional finance and the new world. Couldn't think of anybody better than you, Vikram. Well, thank you. Uh, you, everyone knows what you used to do, former chief executive of Citigroup, now you're chairman and chief executive of the Origin Group. And I wanted to start by perhaps asking you, what is Origin mm -hmm. and what do you do now there? Okay, that's good, I think. So what we just formed, the Origin Group, uh, it's an operating company. We invest in um, financial services companies and we buy financial services companies. Um, we formed this with uh, uh, Mike Angelakis at Ateros and Comcast. Uh, and it's a very long-term venture, um, not uh, a traditional private equity invest and harvest uh, venture. We invest on a long-term basis as an operating company, and we hope to work with uh, these companies to make them successful. All of it is against what we believe is going to be the new architecture in finance. Uh, it's against evolve. what you oh, yeah, Well, uh, no. In, in all of it will be consistent with the new architecture of finance that will, uh, we think, unfold over the next many years. So what kinds of companies do you invest in? What, what bit of the space are you in? Um, well, we've just started in this area, uh, and so we're looking at a lot of uh, companies. Uh, but we have a definite view um, of the shift in financial services. I think we are seeing the era of large, vertically, horizontally integrated conglomerates being unbundled. That's your old lot. That's, that's um, I, 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 I have some familiarity <laughs> with that, yes. Um, that's being unbundled, and I think you're gonna have a, a number of companies um, that evolve, that serve specific segments, or offer particular platforms, and those are the kind of companies that uh, that we like. And, and, and where like. in the life cycle of these companies are you going to be? Are you going to be mm -hmm. you know, right at the beginning of startups or a more mature company? Right. So we've done um, uh, a lot of investments at the beginning of the cycle, and we started doing that about three and a half years ago. We have a um, fairly good portfolio um, uh, away from the origin group of having done that. But one of the things that we have noticed is a lot of these companies are maturing. They're getting bigger, and that within uh, the realm of uh, startups um, competing, you are now evolving to a par point where some of these companies actually have meaningful businesses. They're profitable, um, they're growing, and, and they can use some scale. So we are, you should think about us as growth equity. It's not venture capital, and it's not your traditional um, LBO and private equity companies, but these, this is growth equity where we will provide the capital necessary for these companies that have shown profitability, that are starting to emerge, and they're at that point where they can scale. Where can we can, can you go give us there. some examples of the kinds of companies that you're, I mean, you, can, you can be general enough that we can't exactly work yeah. out what they are if you haven't yeah. announced it, but what kinds of companies? So I think to do that, you sort of have to think a little bit about how's the architecture changing? And, and I think the best analogy I can think of is um, what happened in the mobile phone business. I mean, for a long period of time, you had people like Nokia have these wonderful handsets, which were completely hardware driven, completely programmed. And I think about them as sort of one piece vertically integrated. And then you know, Steve Jobs and the rest of them went to a very different architecture. They went to an architecture where there were operating systems, technology providers, and apps. And so think about the transition of a financial system from that of a Nokia phone to a iOS or Android system with apps and hardware providers. That's the transition we're so, seeing. So that's really interesting. Let's continue that analogy and let's sort of assume that Citigroup is the Nokia phone and, and you've got a new, uh, you're, you're looking for the next Steve Jobs, the next Apple. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations today about right. how there isn't yet the single big, you know, the Apple, the Amazon, the Google mm -hmm. in, in the fintech space. Do mm -hmm. you think there will be, or do you think it's going to be a different kind of outcome? Well, uh, so finance is very, very different than most industries. It's, it's definitely not a winner-take-all business. And so I think it's going to be a rare company that's going to turn out to be a Google or an Apple. Um, and so it's also an industry where you're gonna have different competing models with us for a long period of time. Even if you think about the, um, the mobile phone business, you have operating systems, you have apps, and you have technology providers. 
you know, there's a possibility that people who provide operating systems can have scale. So there can be companies um, like a MasterCard Visa, but new versions of those that could have scale in real size and that could be very large, or large companies over time. But a lot of the companies in finance are apps providers. I mean, a lending company is an app provider at the end of the day. And so you should see all kinds of companies evolve through this. The, but the one principle being unbundling from a bundled Nokia phone. Let's, um, and the whole theme, as you know today, has been kind of where are you going to see collaboration and where are you going to see the unbundling yes. uh, and where are you going to see the, the disruptors coming in. Which of the, and I'm, I'm going to, I don't, I, if I push this, this mobile phone analogy too far, I'll get lost in it, but you know, which, which elements of the mm -hmm. financial business are the ones where the incumbents, your old guys, yep. Yep. Are, are going to stay the strongest? Well, um, you know, we've got to see that. We have to see how that evolves over time. Today, the biggest advantage the incumbents have is deposit insurance. They have funding. That's their single biggest advantage. And so when you look at what's happening in competition um, in FinTech and other areas, you can almost split the industry by those businesses that need funding versus those businesses that don't need funding. There are lots of great competitors and lots of great companies in those businesses that don't need funding. Things like payments or things like data or operating systems or um, you know, or, or indices or ratings or things of that sort, um, the funding-based models are the ones that are toughest to go after because we don't have a funding architecture yet in the world other than deposit insurance. And so that bifurcation is an important one. So banks are going to do extremely well in lending and are going to continue to do that for a long period of time. Although, the, let's, let's go through them because the, the, it, the perhaps one could say three different drivers of, of this whole space. One is the pace of innovation, the technology yep. itself. Mm -hmm. Secondly, regulation and the regulatory environment. And the third, I think perhaps is the sort of, this is something we haven't talked about too much today, but the broader macro environment. Mm -hmm. And that surely affects the relative ease of access to capital. Mm -hmm. and, and doesn't that mean that in this kind of you know, low interest rate, uh, low flat yield curve kind of world, the funding advantage that comes is lesser than it would otherwise be? Um, one would think so. Uh, uh, but other than insured deposits, which are sticky and long-term sources of capital, for most of the rest of the people and the companies who want to be in the lending business, they have to go to the capital markets to get funding. And those markets are young. They are maturing. It's going to take some time. So you may be right. Maybe we just have to watch the space and see how it grows over time. But today, the funding advantage is significant for banks. So deposit insurance is the single biggest advantage for banks. Absolutely. What about the broader regulatory structure? Because the, the, there is, we've had a lot of discussions yeah. this afternoon that it's a you know, huge amount of problems that come from the regulatory structure. But isn't it also a big barrier to entry? Well, I mean, I think you've got to admit that the financial system, whatever it is, whatever it looks like, is going to be a complete reflection of what the regulatory architecture is all about. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, so this, the system lives at the pleasure of the regulators. I mean, that's, that's sort of the nature of the financial business. Um, and so, um, yeah, but, but, um, but different regulators around the world think differently. I mean, if you go to the UK, if you have a good... Brilliant regulators. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, if you have a clever idea of helping an underserved part of the UK uh, with a lending product, you can actually go to the Bank of England and get a banking license. That's quite difficult in the US. So I, don't, I think it's, um, it's a, it depends a whole lot on where you are. Is the US singularly bad? Can you think of a large developed economy that has a worse? Uh, you know, I'm not going to answer that. I mean, <laughs> just, that's, yeah. I thought I'd ask. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, you know, more seriously, the regulatory structure suggests yes. that somebody said earlier today, you know, a lot of fintech is really about regulatory arbitrage. Do you think that's true? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, if I were to think about this, I think if, if, there, if there is a regulatory benefit, it accrues to the incumbents. My God, you can carry 20 to 1 levered balance sheets. And if you can't make money at a 20 to 1 leverage ratio, 
I mean, that's, it's that's, that's, it's, 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 it's a tough thing to sort of say that somehow having a 20 to 1 leverage ratio is a handicap. You know, but that's what you get when you are regulated. So I'm not sure this argument about, about um, regulatory arbitrage is necessarily the right argument today. But one thing we can agree on is if you want to see uh, the regulatory architecture evolve, um, you want to see an architecture that encourages competition. And, and you know, if you go to Singapore, they're thinking about that. And if you go to the UK, you can get a banking license and, and you can start um, being in a lending business. So any architecture that understandably is aware of safety and soundness, but Does the UN creates system competition, encourage competition? It does it. Um, well, uh, look, as I said, um, anything that's not funding related, you're starting to see a lot of competition out there, and that's coming out of the Valley, it's coming out of, uh, of uh, New York. Uh, there are lots of platforms that are being built, um, and where, whether or not these platforms themselves are successful, they're going to put a lot of pressure on the banks to modernize and offer products in a, in a cheaper, more affordable way, all of that. So, so that part, I think, is happening. We're still early, but that part is happening. The part that is not happening as fast as those products that need funding. And those are the places where the incumbents have a huge advantage today. So there are in the audience here many, many representatives from, from new firms, from disruptors, right. but also many from incumbents. Um, yeah. If you were still running a big bank, and knowing what you now know, having looked at what's going on uh, in this space, in the, in, the, in the upstart, so to speak, uh, what would you be looking to do? Who you, what kinds of firms would you be looking to partner with? Well, thankfully, I don't really have to think about that. Um, and, uh, and that's a great advantage as you start thinking about the architecture, where the world's going, versus how do you try to modernize what you have. Um, so look, I mean, let me, let, me, let me sort of use one more analogy, OK? And you, know, you could be a medallion cab company and decide you'll be the most modern one, and you can order this cab online or on the, on the mobile phone, et cetera, you can be really with it. And that becomes an online cab company. But that's a fundamentally different company than an Uber. Uber is a fundamentally different model. And so part of what's going on in, in, in finance, it's not about technology and modernization. It's about whether there are different business models that can serve the functions of finance equally. And that shift is a very hard shift for incumbents. That is the innovator's dilemma. The shift of business model is a hard one. Should we expect every bank to have you know, mobile apps and things? Of course they're going to do that. Are they going to modernize that technology? Of course they're going to do that. Are they going to sort of be the best Nokia phone? Of course they're going to do that. But that works to a certain extent. I think the questions for large banks it's a tough one, uh, is, is do you migrate to the Uber, Uber type models or how do you do that or do you do that? And that's not easy because banks are still making a lot of money. The last numbers I saw, uh, banks are back to the same dollar amount of profits as they had prior to the crisis. Now they're earning a lower ROE because the capital requirements are higher, but the, the point is that's a lot of profitability to give up against the current model, which makes it very difficult to do anything other than just say, I'm going to modernize what I'm doing today. That's a really interesting analogy. It's not obvious that it bodes very well for the banks if they're the medallion cab owners. Um, uh, I use taxi cabs all the time. You know, it's a, <laughs> you know, it's a, you know. But it does also suggest that there will be big new players, the, the Uber equivalent. So that's what we're trying to do. We think oh, that's there, what are, there are going to be new champions that emerge. So you're building the, the Uber of I'm, finance. I'm, I'm not building anything right now. You're going to um, find the We're Uber just starting. Uh, but the point on that is we do think that, that through this shift, new champions are going to emerge. Um, and these are going to be very interesting companies that, um, um, that um, are likely to be companies that are more affordable. Um, they provide transparency, connectivity. These are companies that are likely to increase access uh, for, uh, for people to be part of finance. Um, and, um, and so, yes, we believe that there will be new champions emerging. And, and will they be entirely new champions that, that kind of grow up in the fintech space, or will they be 
the Amazon, the Google, the Facebook, the guys who are already very big in a different space moving into financial services? I think you're going to find all of that. Um, you know, look for every, uh, let me speak as an economist for a minute. For every real transaction, there's a monetary transaction that has to happen. So in, in some theoretical way, half of the world is finance. It's a huge area, and, and, and we still don't have all aspects of finance where they need to be in, in many ways. And so have we seen in Kenya a telephone company being the largest uh, uh, financial services company? Yes. I mean, do we see in other parts of the world retailers being in finance? Absolutely. So I, I, I think we've got to think about finance less as an institutional structure, more as what are the functions that people need? And think about who can perform those functions best. And through all the decades and centuries, the financial business has gone through that evolution. Institutional structures change, but the functions that finance needs to serve have not changed. And you're at that point again, and those functions can be served by telephone companies, by platforms, by retailers, but by new champions as well. Do you, where do you think, in, where geographically is this going to come from? I mean, you've, you've mentioned the U.S. regulation relative yeah. to other countries in the world, and you've just mentioned Kenya. I mean, is the U.S. going to be leading this innovation, or is it actually going to come from, we have a debate on China coming next, is it mm -hmm. going to come from somewhere else in the world? In many ways, China's way ahead in some mm -hmm. of these areas. So, I mean, I think um, we need to think about innovation in a slightly different way. This isn't about technological innovation. No. It's, right. it's known, usable uh, you know, technology that's already there. It's not about, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of, it, it, it's really about institutional innovation. It's about business model innovation. Um, and that can happen anywhere. And the great thing about the world today is that models globalize really fast. I mean, if you just look at what's happening in China, it's incredible. I mean, there are lots of um, lots of aspects of their regulatory architecture that encourages um, this uh, notion of branchless financing. But in, but in this space, regulation is surely more important than it is, say, in the case of Uber. Uber developed outside the regulatory framework to keep the taxi analogy going. In finance, pretty much everywhere, there is some regulation perhaps m more heavy here than elsewhere. Absolutely. And I think that's where it is so encouraging to look at regulators around the world and how they're looking forward. And all you have to do is go to Singapore and talk to the regulators there and think about how... What is it? You mentioned Singapore about three times. What is it about Singapore that is so brilliant uh, in this particular... Well, I think, I think there's a lot good about Singapore, even away from this. But the point um, that I would make is that uh, they're very much forward thinking about where finance might go. And they're thinking about, okay, what standards do they need to have in place? What's the regulatory architecture? Should we think about the model as an iOS system and apps and, and hardware? And if that's the case, what are the API standards? You know, what are the connectivity standards? They're thinking about this um, very actively from the perspective of saying, um, you know, let's be there to drive competition. Uh, with one clear view. It can serve more people, it can serve people at a better price, it can increase access, um, and frankly, at the end of the day, that's what drives growth. And th these are, uh, and I, I don't want to single them out, mm -hmm. I, and, uh, uh, although I think they're very, very forward-looking, there are many other regulators around the world who are thinking about these things. But, but U.S. regulators could I told you I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to open to questions, and I have some more questions for you, but I'm sure there are plenty of questions from the audience. I'm just a little confused about your statement that um, we're going to see a new architecture. I believe that there's more consolidation in the banking industry now than there was seven or eight years ago before the crisis. Are, are you saying this is all going to come as an avalanche down the road, or is it simply, as is being implied, that the U.S. is so heavily regulated uh, kind of strangled that we're not going to have that regulation or these platforms are going to be underneath, as one of the earlier speakers said, like an Oracle or an SAP, and then the banks are going to kind of build on top of those, but you'll have an unregulated sector which will be dynamic and a regulated banking sector that won't. First of all, I don't think there's anything in finance that's not ultimately regulated in some way um, through osmosis, if need be, but it's... Uh, uh, so it's, it's less about that. Um, so what's happening? What's happening is that a great 
young companies are taking parts of what banks do and, do, and, and they're doing it better. And you see that in supply chain finance. You're seeing that in payments. You're seeing that um, you know, in terms of um, underwriting data. You're seeing that in fraud prevention. Doesn't matter what it is that banks need. Uh, and a lot of banks do all of this on their own. And what's happening is companies are picking off areas, picking off clients, picking off products, picking off geographies, and saying, I can serve this area better than anybody else. That's the unbundling. And once you start that unbundling, you unleash a level of competition where, where, where people can use these bundles as a way to create products and services. It's early. Let me just say this. I mean, we're, we're sitting here, we're talking about this uh, today as if it's imminent and it's going to happen tomorrow, and it's not. Um, we're, uh, I'm old enough to remember when Mosaic used to be the browser. I don't know if there's anybody in here who remembers <laughs> that. Um, and that was before Netscape was a browser. We're in that era. We are in that early era. And look, it's taken Amazon and Walmart 20 years so that Walmart is finally feeling the pressure of Amazon in many ways. So this is a long cycle. It's not about overnight changes. It's directionally right. We do think there are going to be new champions emerging, but competition is happening. And the challenge here for the regulators is a simple one. We want competition, yet we're using the old architecture. How do we marry the two to make it happen correctly? That's the challenge. And a lot of them are grappling with it and thinking about it. That leads actually to a question that came via the app, which is, if the entrenched do not innovate, won't they run the higher risk? Rather than risking current and short-term income, they will risk extinction. Well, you know, I, uh, isn't that the innovator's dilemma? I mean, it, it's sort of that question that is, it completely encapsulates it, doesn't it? I mean, you know, Wall Street um, looks for looks ahead next quarter, looks at earnings quarter by quarter. And if you go to the Valley, they're thinking about the next quarter century. It's a, you know, the, the time frames are different in here. And you know, I, I completely appreciate and understand that you've got to look quarter to quarter because if you don't, your shareholders are gonna be all over you, the board members are gonna be all over you. Can their shareholders, will their shareholders allow them to do what it takes? to migrate their business model, make the expenditures that are necessary to move the models out. This isn't about finance, it's about any large business. Any large business that gets disrupted, it's very difficult. So, but I think finance is different than other industries. You're gonna have coexisting models, and it's a long cycle. And you're gonna have coexisting models with collaboration between incumbents and new starts in, in some parts. You're gonna have big new players taking over other parts, and down the road, will you have something that there will be no vertically integrated Nokia equivalent left? Oh, I'm not so sure of that necessarily. I mean, we still have Walmarts, right? <laughs> the Walmarts are still there. Amazon's still there. These are long cycles. And so the most important thing to me is that um, uh, what's happened in other industries is coming to finance. And that in this process, you're going to have new models emerge that's gonna create more competition. It is going to change the nature of the financial services business. Hopefully that means we have, a, uh, we have an architecture that's, um, that serves people better, serves more people, it's cheaper, it's more accessible, and you know, these are all good things because they take friction out of the economy and that's what drives growth. Are there any more questions? Yes, gentlemen here, fine. He's not allowed to ask a question, by the way. <laughs> So the question is that IPOs, um, when they're done, large firms still charge six, seven percent commissions. Why? And, is that sustainable? You know, is that sustainable? I'd ask the same question about um, you know selling and buying homes and real estate. Why are commissions still five, six percent out there? Um, and by the way, they aren't in China. Uh, all you need to do is go to China and Asia and you see what the difference is between the commission structure in these two areas versus where it is here. So we've been asking that question for a long period of time. I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. Um, um, and, and, and more importantly, Snapchat can afford to pay it, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Another question from the app. 
Will Amazon be the Amazon of fintech? That is, an outsider with deep pockets and tech bias as the winner, disrupting both the entrenched and the newbies. So is it going to be Amazon? Um, well, they certainly have a lot of data. Um, they certainly have all the skills like machine learning. They have, you know, their marginal cost of processing a transaction is zero. Uh, basically, at the end of the day. So they have a lot of the advantages that drive um, um, th that intimacy with clients, that cost structure down to zero, and they've done an amazing job. I mean, it really is an amazing company um, in, in what they've been able to accomplish. Um, so the question becomes, okay, what do they do next? Well, I, I think they're already in payments. They probably are. I mean, I don't know, Tom, if you know, but they, they must be moving money back and forth. That's an easy business. Amazon, yep, absolutely. Prime, right? e easy business to move, uh, to move money back and forth. Um, but again, finance is a huge area. I mean, if you think about finance, you've got to, you know, you have to fund IBM, you have to fund, you know, General Electric, and then you, you've got, um, you know, pay, you know, uh, sort of uh, merchant advances. There are lots and lots of different areas. Can I see them inching their way up to help their suppliers and their customers? Of course, we can see that very well. Do I see them being a regulated bank? No. One thing I continue to see is technology is just trying to automate existing processes. The disruption is where technology is done to do something new or different. I don't know what your perspective is there or kind of. Yeah. No, I think that's it's 100 percent right. And so the poster child for that is a blockchain, isn't it? Uh, the, the difference between blockchain and all the technology in the world, if you apply technology to finance in a much better way than the back office runs today, all you'll be doing is taking that paper-oriented process that's been going on for 200 years, modernizing it, making it cheaper, versus blockchain being an application that bypasses all of that. So that's an example exactly of the uh, stuff we're talking about. Um, uh, but that's exactly how these, these entrepreneurs are thinking. They're saying, okay, underwriting was done in this particular way. Why does it have to be done this particular way? Let's try it this way. Isn't it better? So that's, that's uh, part of FinTech, um, uh, but not all of it, because frankly, just about anything in finance that's being done today, you can apply technology to and some clever thinking to and unbundle it and probably do it better than, than it's happening today. Um, so, you know. I think we have Lots time more. for one more question. Um, there were a couple over here. Nope. Nope. They've been, been silenced. Um, well, then I will ask the last question, which is tell us, because we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, you're thinking very long term. You're, you're, yep. you're looking at these companies. You're clearly looking for the next Amazon or whatever we want to call it. In 10 years' time, mm -hmm. what is the financial landscape in a mere 30 seconds going to look like? What are, the, your, what are your old employers or their equivalent going to be doing? And what are those companies, the most successful ones that you're investing in going to be doing? Right. So uh, let me leave you with one thought, and I think this is important. The single most important thing that's going to determine the financial services landscape is what happens to interest rates in the next five to ten years. Okay. It's very hard if you're an asset manager to make money when interest rates are zero to one percent. It's very hard as a bank to make money doing that, all of that. So. Um, you know, I think it's a good question that, that, that you are posing, but um, in finance, as you said before, regulators have a lot well, let me answer that it. question, yeah. and okay. then you tell me what the world will look like. <laughs> and interest rates are going to stay low yes. for the next five years, and mm -hmm. you're going to have a flat yield curve for the yep. next five years. We're in a secular stagnation world. Right. What does that mean for what? Um, in, in that particular case, the pricing of financial services is too expensive for what the world can bear, in which case you're going to see a lot more startups, a lot more companies going after providing financial services in a much more affordable way. And so you will have um, you know, probably a bigger group of new champions emerging. Brilliant. Thank you, Vikram, very much indeed. Mm -hmm.